Thank you again, and um, on your behalf, let me welcome our panelists once more. Um, since this morning, we've had quite um, extensive discussions and presentations on ideas uh, about what to do uh, to make sure that we move from discussion to action, especially with regard to climate finance. So let me begin by um, asking uh, host, uh, uh, President Ruto, what uh, he should consider uh, to be the key elements of a global uh, uh, climate finance architecture uh, that we should all be aiming at, especially when uh, we get to uh, UAE for COP28. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Orama. Um, as I said this morning, how do we move from potential to opportunity? And how do we turn the opportunities we have into jobs, into investments, and into industrialization, manufacturing, and growth. That's really what we need to do. And front and center is the big elephant. Where is the money going to come from? How are we going to finance our transition from opportunity to growth. Um, in my opinion, there are three areas that we need to focus. Number one, we need to focus on where do we find money or resources or financing, number one, at scale. And number one, and number two, that is affordable. And number three, that is accessible. And that is why we have insisted that while we appreciate the contribution of our multilateral development institutions, the current financial architecture to support our progress, what they are doing is good, but it is insufficient because our current challenges are compounded. We are not dealing with a normal situation. We are not dealing with the situation for which this institution were, these institutions were built. And therefore, it is important for us to realign our sources of financing with the realities of the moment. The moment we need a scale up of development resources. And that is why we are speaking about scale. At the moment, we need to make sure that these resources are available at rates that are friendly to the investments we want to make. And therefore, in my very honest opinion, the reform of the multilateral development banks will achieve two things. And when we talk about reform of multilateral development banks, some of those banks, whether it is IMF or World Bank, we are shareholders. So legitimately, these are our institutions. And therefore, we need to deal with how do we make these institutions of ours much more fit for purpose? How do we make them fit for purpose? So, um, uh, number one, we think like we did with COVID when there was some creativity and innovation that resulted in special drawing rights. We think that 
there is scope in that window of special drawing rights to meet the challenges that we have of the moment of energy transition. What we, th we, we would want done differently this time is that the manner in which these resources are allocated should be different, where those who need it most get it, while those who need it least don't have to get a lion's share of what they don't need. That's number one. Number two, we believe also creatively and in an innovative manner, there is scope for us to use and leverage the balance sheets of these institutions. And I must do a disclaimer, I am not a financial person, I am a scientist. But I am very confident that we have very intelligent people. We are not short of good economists and analysts and financial people who can imagine that space and tell us what is it that we can do to leverage the um, uh, uh, ba balance sheets of these great institutions. And that is what my sister Motley is talking about, the uh, Bridgetown Initiative. How do we raise an extra $500 billion every year or at least in five years to be able to do what we must do with energy transition? And finally, I think the other option that we need to have a conversation about is carbon tax. This is, is a very controversial thing, but it is the right thing to have the conversation about. However controversial it may be, I mean, we need to have a conversation about carbon tax. If we are to raise the scale of resources needed for energy transition, we must have a conversation about carbon tax. In fact, the numbers speak to it. The IMF has actually done a lot of work around it. And they have told us it is possible to raise 870 billion shillings from carbon tax. The only problem that IMF is pointing to us is that there is insufficient political will. And there are challenges with political will. Surely, faced with an existential threat to humanity, aren't we able to master the political will to achieve this? And let me give one more thought around it. The EU Parliament has already considered FTT, the financial transaction tax, as a means of raising resources to deal with climate change. And in fact, they've gone all the way to their Parliament. So, the idea of a carbon tax is no longer remote. We must have it firmly on the table. And finally, uh, Professor, we are making these suggestions because we are practical. We are dealing with practical situations. As I said this morning, nine countries have already gone off the cliff. Many are on the way there to debt distress because of high interest rates and because of climate change. Unless we deal with it, and let us not uh, imagine that we are, we are sorted, especially because when we were in Paris, admittedly, there were found ways of dealing with countries that have been already in default. But the question we ask ourselves, do we have to wait until countries have gone to default to sort them out? Isn't it possible for us to sort them out ahead of the cliff? And that is the conversation we are having. And um, let me conclude by saying that this time round, we're going to be firmly on the table. It doesn't matter 
how uncomfortable this conversation is. It doesn't matter who we annoy. We are going to be here until we are heard and until the right thing happens. No, thank you very much. Uh, let me um, uh, go to uh, a, a chairperson, Mr. Faki. Uh, chairperson, you, you just heard what uh, President Ruto said. Um, as we form uh, the, the views as a continental view, um, from the African Union's perspective, uh, what what should we be expecting? What um, is uh, the African Union's uh, views and strategy to make sure that all these ideas that, are, that we, are, we are forming here uh, find their way into implementable actions uh, when uh, the COP28 convenes? Thank you. Merci. Professeur Orama, j'ai écouté effectivement attentivement le président Ruto. Président Ruto. Et je l'en remercie. And I thank him. Je le remercie pour son plaidoyer fort. I thank him for his strong advocacy, his leadership. Mais aussi et surtout. But also and particularly for the concrete proposals that he has put on the table. La situation. The situation of Africa is well known. The challenges faced by the continent are known. The expectations that are nurtured are known. Its important potential also is known. The promises made to Africa are also known. There is a lot of literature on this matter. Now, what should we do? This is the question. First, we have to accept the specific nature of the continent. 600 million Africans don't even have electricity. It is a continent which is under-industrialized, and then is being asked here and now to bring about the ecological transition. President Macky Sall earlier was saying that we need to follow the rhythm and peculiarity of this continent. All this can be possible. Transition, yes, it is important, but we need to establish the necessary conditions for it to become possible. Africa is not coming empty-handed. It is a reservoir. So I think we need to think of that, how this important potential may be harnessed for the benefit of its peoples. This is a substantive issue. Are the promises that have been made, including the reform of fin international financial institutions, and what we have seen in the past, the structural adjustment programs, which for decades uh, had been applied by the African states. And I recall, I'm talking of Chad, my country, we were asked even uh, that certain agricultural productivity, particularly rice, they should stop the production and import rice. It did not work. We have to admit that. It did not work. Then we went to programs of uh, the World Bank, poverty reduction. What is the result? Let's take stock. Some countries are now even poorer. And I do not exclude, and I am not condoning poor governance, and I am not excluding the responsibilities of the states, but the special drawing rights. There was some hope out of 650 million. We got only, and I'm really 
asking whether this was disbursed, 33 million or 33 billion, after a terrible pandemic like COVID, can we uh, really have economic recovery? It is not possible. The Green Fund, we have been told about it. All this within a context of debt, debt servicing, and then the situation of countries that are appreciated, which are con uh, some countries that are considered arid. I'm not a pessimist, and by the profession, my training, my uh, cannot be pessimist. That is why we expect, and from this important conference, and it is very timely, so that around the table with our partners, with the financial institutions, with international organizations and the member states, since the challenge of climate change does not forgive anybody, does not distinguish between African, American or Indian, I think we are all in the same boat. Let us make sure that this boat doesn't sink. That is the real problem. I'm not a technical expert to go into the various uh, labyrinths of how to market carbon, etc., and all. I think we cannot be just content with promises. Those that have been uh, promises made have never been fulfilled, have never been honored. Let us ask ourselves the real question, and honestly, whether politically we have decided this time to be serious and to be consistent. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I think with uh, the kind of enthusiasm we've seen here, the, the passion and the commitments shown by our leaders, I, I, I believe that um, Africans have, have had enough I think everybody now wants to see action uh, because we've used many years to think and talk about what can be done. Now it is what will be done. Uh, with that, uh, let me invite our brother uh, uh, Mo Ibrahim to join the panel. Mo. Yes. Uh, Well, thank you, thank you for for joining us. <laughs> so, uh, let me ask uh, Prime Minister Matbuli. Um, given the challenges uh, many countries face today, the financing challenges, interest rates, debt overhang, um, and of course the um, the large financial requirement for meeting uh, the uh, climate uh, finance requirements uh, at country level and, the con and continental level and so on. What would be your suggestion on the best approach? Uh, 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 President Afuweki mentioned we should look in what we shouldn't look outside. Many said we should look outside. So uh, there are different views. Um, the important thing is we need the money. So from your perspective, uh, what would be the suggestion on how to find the money? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by stating that climate finance is undeniably the central pillar for empowering the delivery of climate goals and nationally determined contribution or indices, in particular for our African continent. In this regard, allow me to summarize Egypt's vision in this respect as follows. First, climate finance constitutes a cornerstone and foundation for the full implementation of national commitments and contribution as outlined by developing countries and to the transition to a green economy and, ad and addressing climate change issues. 
international agreements, including the UN FCCC and Paris Agreement, clearly established a direct link between the level of financing provided to developing countries to support their efforts and the level of ambition and national actions. From, and needless to mention that this does not imply any backsliding from exerting maximum efforts nationally to deliver an, on ambitious commitment and NDCs, but rather underscores that financing should serve as a key driver and enabler to complement national resources with a clear goal of swift and effective implementation. Secondly, it is essential to deal with the staggering funding gap with a realistic approach and build upon current estimates to enable the implementation of the commitment declared by developing countries, which amount to around 5.6 trillion US dollar by 2030. The required investment in the renewable energy alone is approximately 1 trillion dollar annually. Likewise, the amount of international funding needed to achieve carbon neutrality amounts to about 4 trillion US dollar annually. These are the estimates required to implement the scientific recommendation to maintain the 1.5 degree target. Thirdly, this volume of financing underscores the need for a significant overhaul of international financial institutions and multilateral developing banks in alignment with the objective laid out in Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan. This restructuring should be driven by three core goals. Additionality, through increasing climate financing levels without impacting the funding already designated for sustainable development and poverty eradication. Accessibility, through facilitating access to climate finance by developing countries without stringent the conditions and other obstacles and right finance instruments through offering concessional financing instruments and removing, as His Excellency President Rotu mentioned, and removing the unfair and unbalanced rate posed on developing and African countries, including the surcharge imposed by some multilateral development banks. Such a reform should also consider the constraints posed on by debt limited resources for adaptation efforts, the escalating cost of financing due to the interest rate surges, and the collateral requirements to entice global investment. In a sense, this approach aims to prevent the deepening of the debt crisis in the developing world and the African continent. Fourthly, there is a need to transform the challenges of debt into an opportunity for innovative financing mechanism. This includes effective mechanism for debt for climate swap, redirecting financing towards developmental and environmental projects, as well as a review of international financial institutions policies regarding restrictions and fees on loans to developing countries. In this context, we welcome the Bridgetown Initiative as a step to forward in facilitating financing for developing countries facing the impact of climate change. I, I would like further highlight Egypt initiatives in partnership with the Economic Commission of Africa on Sustainable Debt Coalition endorsed by African Ministers of Finance, which aim at decreasing the cost of green financing. Those initiatives contribute to the reform of the international financial architecture. We already have the support of more than 22 African countries for the Sustainable Debt Coalition and call for all African countries to join these initiatives. Lastly, it is crucial to explore innovative financing tools, including carbon market and certain fees or taxes on specific activities and economic sectors. But in doing so, and in considering such innovative sources, we need to ensure that they are in line 
with the international agreements and fully considering its socio-economic implications, particularly on our developing countries. At the same time, ensuring that we are refraining from any unilateral actions that might hinder the competitiveness of our African exports or our ability to attract foreign direct investments. I would like, at the end, to state that Egypt firmly believes that raising the level of ambition in the new NDCs without a corresponding increase in appropriate financing and a review of current financing mechanism will not contribute to achieving the desired goal, whether in energy transition, emissions reduction or adaptation. It is imperative that we, we witness a clear shift in the policies of multilateral financial institutions and development partners in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, for that. And I, I think you just sent a message um, inviting all African countries who have not yet joined uh, the coalition uh, to do so. There are 22 already. I think the invitation is for the rest, 20, uh, 33 countries to consider joining so that you can have one voice in pushing this. So thank you. Um, let me go to the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Kag. Uh, you've heard uh, from um, African leaders uh, about their expectations, what they want uh, from the discussions that have been ongoing on, on financing uh, climate. Um, you looking from outside to inside, uh, what is your take on that? on what they've said, what would you suggest, and what do you think uh, the uh, developing economies or developed economies can do uh, to support the initiatives that have been proposed? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for President Ritu for this fantastic initiative. Actually, I don't think there are any sides. There are just different shades of the same coin and different potential affordability and accessibility, but there's one side and that's the climate action and the urgency. Because we are one humanity and we will all perish together, some sooner than later, but this is the stark reality. So I think from that vantage point, we've heard a lot also in recent years, we know what success looks like. The big question remains political leadership, political will. And this is where differentiation lies in, because some countries will have to do more and others will have to do less and some might lie in between. Let me just detail this. We know we need to stand for climate justice, and this needs to be detailed in a more meaningful way so it makes sense to all, that also general audiences in Western Europe or OECD countries actually figure this out from a relative vantage of an advanced economy. We need to consider equity and urgency. Now, I'm very seized with the notion of opportunity because I think it's very big. It's equally important and it's the only way we can drive this agenda away from being only an existentialist crisis and to keep people along with this flow. Now the how, that's the what. The how is straightforward technical support, but it differs per country. It can be high level technical support, but it needs to be quick, needs to be available and it needs to be affordable. And very often it's still costed by the countries themselves. Here we need to fix that. Equally so, I think we've lost a lot of time in focusing too much in a lot of agendas on mitigation as opposed to adaptation. I now, we know, now know both need to happen, but we need to make up for lost time. When it comes to finance, of course, very often the elephant in the room. I've been a minister for trade and aid. I've worked a long time for the UN. The best ideas fall foul of lack of political will or affordability and finance the substance most can agree to. Now, on the MDBs, we really think as shareholders and as partners in this endeavor, the reforms, the capital adequacy framework reforms need to happen now. There's an institutional burden of proof and leadership at the MDBs, as well as the IFIs, as well as the shareholders. I think President Ritu said that as well. We're all in this. We own part of it. We need to make this happen. We also see potential in differentiated pricing, in hybrid capital. It's only a pilot, but let's make the pilots work and scale them up. 
Too much time is lost in talking about pilots that remain standalone pilots. Secondly, private sector. I've heard a lot in recent years on how the private sector is willing, and I'm fully convinced, yet they need very often the right governance framework, they need to know which partnership they are part of, and they need scalable and ca callable projects where governments, such as mine, can guarantee the risks. The onus should not be on the developing or highly indebted country to also guarantee the risk. This is where I think we sometimes fail to connect the dots. Now, last but not least, governments. We need to really make serious business out of onward lending of the SDRs. We also need to increase the SDRs. We need to provide the additional finance. Now, as a Minister of Finance, of course, my other hat, I'll tell you, this is not a very popular theme. Everybody nods, yes, very important. No, we agree with Mrs. Kag. But then it's either cost-cutting or it's increase of taxation or other means of financial uh, availability. And this is where domestic audiences suddenly become reticent. This is where political will comes in to make this a shared agenda for all of us. It's not easy, it can be done. We actually won elections on this ticket in the Netherlands last time round. I don't think we'll do as well this time, but still, it can be done. Um, innovation, an obvious one. Blended finance mentioned. Green bonds, we were the first AAA rated country that issued green bonds. We can assist other countries, but we also need to find ways for many of the developing countries to issue their own green bonds to also provide for the domestic resource mobilization that needs to happen as part of accountability. The sensitive topic of loss and damage, I look forward to the discussion at the COP28 because I think there's a fair claim that has been put forward. Now the negotiations will see how far we'll go. I think the political symbolism of the discussion is equally important if we talk about equity and a shared agenda. Now last but not least, carbon tax and carbon pricing. Very, very important. Unless you price it, unless you tax it, it often has little meaning. The only way to change behavior, productivity, the way we produce and consume, particularly at the large emitting countries, is if we price it more and we make that part of a global public good. But that's far part of a discussion. Last but not least, together with my, my friend and colleague, uh, Minister of Finance, uh, of Indonesia, I co-chair the, the Global Coalition of Ministers of Finance for Climate Action. So a one second pitch, all Ministers of Finance, if not in the room, join this coalition. Make your budgets work for climate action. This is where the duty and opportunity of care lies. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, for um, the illuminating comments. Uh, I see there is no actually night and day between what uh, uh, the African leaders are saying and what, uh, what you've said. Um, let me now uh, go to Francia, the um, Vice President. Uh, you're from Colombia, uh, from Meru. And then exported to Colombia. <laughs> so, yeah, you are, you, we share the same heritage. And incidentally, the same problems. Uh, we, so we understand ourselves. Uh, we understand the burden we are carrying. We understand the challenges the climate has posed on us. So looking from where you are, uh, inside and listening to our leaders and also the, the, the Prime Minister from the Netherlands, um, what would be your suggestion, uh, especially from your experience uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean? Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. In the first place, I must say that Latin America and the Caribbeans are experiencing the pressures of uh, powerful economies that want to continue exploiting our natural resources. And this pressure uh, of exploiting our natural resources contribute to increasing 
the climate uh, crisis. There are very few of the governments who uh, are taking uh, up the uh, decarbonized economy, uh, an economy that makes a transition and a transformation uh, in this um, matter, uh, obviously, in in, can, in low income countries, the vulnerable countries, or the middle income countries like the Latin American countries, this is a great challenge, because we have based our economy on uh, extraction. We have based our economy on on carbon to coal. In in my country, we are the first alternative government, and we are creating a, a, a change in the laws and also a change of paradigms, in uh, social paradigms, uh, because we have to create a, a, a awareness uh, that contributing to the exploitation that accumulates capital but does not uh, generate well-being and that destroys the ecosystem is not a, a path that we accept. In this sense, we want to make a transition. And as I had said before, we have serious problems, uh, serious financial problems, uh, which uh, in some way do not allow us to resolve the challenges uh, of the effects of the climatic crisis. Uh, but in the case of Colombia, we have a conflict, a social conflict, uh, 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 an armed conflict, a war which we are experiencing, which uh, contributes to increase, uh, exacerbate this situation of vulnerability in our country. And in this sense, I think that we have uh, an uh, increase of the debt uh, with very high interest rates that do not allow that within our country we can uh, have the necessary resources to uh, invest in, in these proposals for uh, energy transition and actions for mitigation and adaptation to the climate change. Uh, this uh, will not change if we continue with the current financial system, as I have said, which has a colonialist uh, point of view. The financial system, the international financial system that we have today is one that does not allow justice, social justice, uh, no, neither does it allow for climatic justice. In, in our countries, the, the basic needs uh, are not satisfied. So, and, and they are very, very, there are lots, lots of needs. We are one of the countries where there are the most inequalities in the planet. Sometimes we have to uh, not invest socially in, in, in drinking water, in health, in, in, in electricity, and connectivity in order to uh, use these resources from the uh, treasury to pay the external debts, which, as I was telling you, uh, has very high interest rates with respect to countries which do not have the same conditions that we have. In this sense, we have uh, spoken about exchange of debt, uh, the debt, debt for uh, climate action with, with new rules, new, not the same traditional rules, uh, because this problem which is not a traditional way of, of cutting out things. We have to innovate with new actions, new rules. Uh, the, the financial system today does not uh, is not does not help us to to face the challenges of climate change. It's not a system that was created for us, uh, and we uh, it's not a just system for our countries. And in this sense, we have uh, uh, come to present a multilateral agreement uh, because this is a, already a global. Uh, crisis that requires a global uh, response. And that means that as we had done during the pandemic, we can uh, do, or, or maybe in this multilateral agreement, we can do what was done during the pandemic to issue special uh, r uh, rights that can allow 
the vulnerable countries and the uh, middle-income countries to generate uh, uh, conditions of flexibility uh, in regard to their debts and to free resources to invest in our lands, in our com communities, in our nations. Uh, otherwise, it would be it wouldn't be possible to look to care for this situation. This is a proposal which President Gustavo Petro has uh, presented to the world, and we agree with President Ruto about the need to reform the financial system, the the uh, the qualif qualifiers of, of 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 debt increase the crisis because in. Uh, a catastrophic situation of our country, uh, the, 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 the risk rating makes it more difficult to access to credit, which uh, allows us to finance these programs. Uh, therefore, we are in a situation of um, uh, inequality and uh, which has some effects that are higher than those of other countries that are in better economic conditions. And this implies that we have to think that Latin America and the Caribbeans and Africa should unite with one voice and to present in a very specific way what we have been uh, uh, doing to reform the financial system so that our countries uh, we can access to better conditions of uh, social and climatic justice. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Francia, uh, for, for those comments and insights. Uh, let me now go to Abu uh, Mo. Mo, you, I will call you a, a private sector person, a businessman, and uh, philanthropist, uh, so you, you straddle all. So you have been campaigning for uh, good governance, campaigning for climate justice, and, and so on. As we gather here to have a common view, a common position for Africa as we prepare to go to COP28, and having listened to it, everybody here. From your perspective as a philanthropist, as a businessman, um, what would you like to add? Or what do you think we should not take with us to the world? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? OK. I really have four points uh, to make. And uh, the first one really is uh, there is a silver bullet to solve this problem. And we are just like dodging all that to talk about, oh, how we can get more money for climate finance. Just tax carbon. Use the market. You guys in the rich countries taught us about your invented capitalism, invented market. Why aren't you applying market forces to carbon? Why? And that is the question, because the problem now is that uh, people make promises. Oh, you know, those uh, poor guys in Africa and somewhere else, they have a problem there. Okay, well, we are, we are kind people, you know. I, we're going to offer them some money. How about $100 billion for climate fund? But then, actually, things are tight. Oh, sorry, uh, we cannot make it this year. Well, in those guys' mind, it's charity. It's charity. And that's a mistake. It should not be charity. This should be an international clear agreement. You break it, you own it. That is the honest answer. Without changing the market dynamic, will not change. Now, every American man, woman, child emits 17 tons every year. Every European, 
six and a half to seven tons a year. China, same. Now, the question here, excuse me, who gave you the right to use all this amount of carbon? We are eight billion people in this planet. Science tells us we cannot emit more than 24 billion tons a year. That's three tons per head. Three tons per head. Who gave the Americans the right to do 17? Who gave the Europeans the right to do seven? Why? You pay for it. If you pay for it, then you change. Then you cannot change behavior unless you pay for it. The only problem is that we do have very few statesmen. We have many politicians, very few statesmen. President uh, Juncker, who is the president of the African Union, uh, sorry, European Union a few years ago, said something very beautiful, actually. He said, you know what? All of us politicians, we know what to do. But we don't know how to get elected if we do it. And that is a problem. That is a problem. We have a lot of politicians who want to be elected, but nothing will happen then. So nothing happens. So we must fight for carbon tax. I love what the Deputy Prime Minister said about that. And the first time I hear a senior European politician say that, look, soon there's going to be a seat available for the Prime Minister in your country. I hope you get it. Anyway, because that, that's honorable of you to say that. Those guys are in denial. Who put all this carbon up there? Who put it up? Own it. You need to own what you break something, you do it. That's the fairest point. Without carbon tax, everything else is charity. It doesn't work. That's one thing. Second thing, we talk about investment in Africa and green investment. We have been talking about investment in Africa for ages, but nobody invests in Africa. Trickle. Simple reason, it is impossible to invest in Africa. If the, all this uh, uh, rating agency rate you guys as junk, you are sub-grade investment. Who are going to invest here? Most of the money out there, private money, is in pension funds, insurance companies. By law, they cannot invest here. By law. If, if I'm running an insurance company here and I want to put a billion dollars, and a lot of those people are nice people. They want to invest in Africa. But they say, look, if I invest a billion dollars, I have to put another billion dollars here as a security because, I'm sorry, but you are subgrade. You are not investable uh, uh, grade for me. This system is broken. It has to be sorted out. And this rating agency, they all have one office in South Africa, as if South Africa is Africa, 54 countries. They sit in South Africa and pontificate about all of Africa. Again, those guys act as auditors, and guess what? They sell consultancy for African countries about how to improve their grade. Excuse me? This is a clear conflict of interest. You cannot grade people and you go and say, I offer you consultancy how to improve your grade. Excuse me? People go to prison for that. Anyway, so that is something about the, the, the rating agency. It has to be sorted out. Then we come to this multilateral. I'm amazed about the lack of governance in the World Bank and the IMF. And, I, I, you know, I, I told the Ajay and uh, Kristalina the other day, we were all in Paris for a meeting. Uh, I said, you guys, if you are running, all your banks are listed, and any decent stock exchange, you will have been delisted because your governance sucks. Can you have a listed company, can you have any bank in the world 
without senior independent directors? Where are the independent directors in the World Bank? None. It's the shareholders who, major shareholders, hug it. Where is the independent directors? Where is the voice of the other countries? Fine, major shareholders keep 60%, 70% of the shares. Fine, but let some fresh air in the room. Get some independent directors in the room. Otherwise, your governance sucks. You'll be delisted. Something else gross really happening on this institution. Do you know that these are the only banks in the world where the board sits in the headquarters? They sit in the headquarters with their staff. And I ask Ajay, how you run your business? You are the president of this institution and you have this board and their staff living on top of you, running around, telling the staff what to do, lobbying for their countries, whatever interest, no, 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 don't give loan to this guy. Hey, you must give that. What is this? This is breach of basics of good governance. Do you know how much it costs the World Bank to keep those guys in residence. Every year it is over hundred million dollars. Do you know that? Hundred million dollars to house the board and their staff every year. Excuse me, what is the job of the World Bank? To eradicate poverty? To hundred million dollars every year would have educated one million kids in Egypt every year. Why those guys sit there? Spending 100 million. This is the issue of governance. It has to be addressed. I'll stop here. Well, thank you very much uh, <laughs> uh, for bringing the private sector angle, the market angle to the, to the discussion. But the good thing is that it somehow aligns with the suggestions that have all come here. Uh, what I get from that, because it has me to summarize, uh, is that the carbon tax is an agenda that must be taken uh, from here to COP28. And I also agree with it as a banker, uh, because you are right, um, tax, you use tax and subsidies uh, to make sure that you direct uh, certain actions where you want them to go. So I think that's one of the things. And there's also a consensus um, on reforming the, uh, the international financial ar uh, architecture. I don't want to call it architecture. The way uh, the international financial system operates. And that's not just the multilateral. You touched on even the rating agencies. Um, people can also uh, talk about how the stock exchanges operate, if you want to extend it to all those. So I think a comprehensive approach to it is important. And as I agree, um, that the part of the problem is uh, that the negotiations we have is, is David and Goliath negotiation. Incidentally, the person we should be telling to do more is the, is the Goliath. And the, the others are the Lilliput, uh, who really should be treated more fairly. Uh, but your voice can't rise uh, to, 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 to that level. But by coming together, coming together as Africans, coming together with the Caribbean, Latin America, uh, and having um, politicians uh, like the Deputy Prime Minister I think we can start forming a consensus, which started last year in Sharm uh, for the first time. Loss and damage came on the table. Uh, it means some progress is being made. Uh, it's a common problem for everybody. And we must make sure we all work together, reach our poor, uh, those who emit and those who don't emit, to make sure we solve it. So thank you. Uh, I would then um, invite, I think, President Ruto to say the last word. Maybe just three things. I want to agree with the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance um, that in this debate there are no sides. We are on the same side. 
And we need to begin to drive this from the same side because the risk that we face when this place burns, it will burn with everybody. The emitters and the non-emitters, the people from the south and the people from the north. That, that is settled. And because of that, we need, it, we need to listen very carefully to what Mo Ibrahim is saying. We need to listen very carefully to what Mo Ibrahim is saying. Whether it is carbon tax, and then I believe that that conversation is overdue. If we will not be having a conversation about carbon tax in COP27, and not just that conversation, on the mechanism of the how, and with a proper timeline, then we will not have a meaningful conversation. Number two is the conversation around rating agencies. Credit rating agencies are destroying our economies. We have to be honest with them. Their algorithm is faulty. They are not using empirical science, and I'm saying this as a scientist myself, there is a problem, a big problem with creating credit rating agencies. And in some instances, they are conflicted. And there must be a candid conversation about their data, their findings, and whether they are doing the right thing. And finally, is to say, as Africa, we will be putting together the Nairobi Declaration that is going to be candid, bold, and practical for us to carry that conversation into the UN General Assembly and into COP28.